Hi everyone, I noticed that I'm the only one that bring my notes. Hope you don't mind that. It makes me just a little bit comfortable. Um, my topic today is Toronto's heritage trees, a living seed bank for forest restoration. So when we look around Toronto, um, we look into buildings, skyscrapers, trees, and animals that like birds and squirrel, right? And trees are important components of our urban forest as they provide various kinds of ecosystem services. That bring, that bring benefits not only to the local biodiversity, but also human beings. In Toronto, it's actually a tremendous need for forest restoration um, due to the massive deforestation, which was a result of the forest cleaning for settlement and other demands. And in 2004, the City of Toronto's Council committed to increase the canopy cover from 27% to 40%. But actually, it made misleading by this goal because what we know is that, for example, if we have invasive species that all around forests, then it's not a healthy forest. Also, it's can be cover increased to 40%. So what we actually need is 40% can be cover with a healthy forest. Um, as we all know that seeds are the basic element in forest restor restor restoration process, sorry. So, and choosing their origins have important consequences. So what type of trees are suitable to be a good seed source for a healthy forest restoration. Before we head into the answer, um, I want us to look at this data right now. As we all know that the canopy in the Toronto right now is dominated by non-native species, as we can see here, um, and the native species are disappearing. This Venn diagram um, here is to show you that according to the most recent um, inventory of the Toronto city trees, sorry, um, Toronto's native trees were actually 73 historically, but actually we are losing them. Around 41% of them are gone. And what we have right now is 63% of the non-native species, and only 43 of them are native. Um, so what happened to our canopy is that it is actually shifting from native species to non-native species. So when we restore the forest and the canopy cover, we want to see, we, no, sorry, we want this native, native species that in our, in our project. So for two main reasons. The first one is that they genetically adapted to Toronto's climate, which means that they are resilient to Toronto's variation of climate. And the second one is that they adapted to local biodiversity. And the local biodiversity also adapted to them. For example, like um, the, Co-evolution between trees and the biodiversity is what produce the ecosystem services. And thus, native species often process the hardest required to endure Toronto's environment. Moreover, increase the native species richness and diversity can also increase the, maintain the forest, forest health and also for the resilience. And it is not just any native trees that we are talking about. In this talk, we really want to focus on the heritage trees. They are the trees that have existing for a long period of time, and they also have the highest probability that to have that to contain the local provenance genes that adapt to Toronto's climate and biodiversity, for example, like fungi and birds. And also, like the local biodiversity also adapted to them, and thus they can produce seeds that are as healthy and hardy as their parents, that which prove themselves like to withstand all kinds of diseases and natural disturbance. As they are older and maybe larger with greater leaf area, they can produce and bring benefits more than the young trees. And thus we think they can be used as a living seed bank for our healthy forest restoration. In 2009, um, Forest Ontario and Ontario Urban Forest Council launched a heritage tree program, which is an official way to recognize their social, historical, ecological, and cultural value of these trees. And this picture on the right side is the sycamore that is more than 200 years and has been officially recognized as an Ontario heritage tree on the Roseland Drive West. And as a city within a park, Toronto's weaving system is special. And also it's thinly forest valley that um, it is so close to this nature that people can enjoy it within just half an hour's drive. And the ravine lands in Toronto are huge, which is account for 70% of the city's total land area, which is about 27,000 acres. 
and it's actually the location of our of most of our native heritage trees. This is one example from Sunnybrook. One eastern cottonwood with a diameter over 152 centimeter, which is a typical queen size bed width. And as a matter of fact, um, heritage trees are declining globally due to human activities like logging because they are more uh, valuable and worth money, and also the other the other reasons like the land cleaning and agricultural intensification, and also fire management. And of course, nature disturbance is also part of the reason. Therefore, before they disappear, we suggest using the native heritage trees as a living seed bank for our forest restoration to provide the local seeds and to also as a way to maintain their good genetic and to provide the best reforestation success. And these are two objectives of my study. The first one is the species diversity, which means we want to figure out how many of Toronto's 73 species can still be found as old growth trees in the ravines. And are these 73 species down there in the ravines? And the second one is the prioritization, which means that which native species out of the 73 should we focus on first? And here's what we did. We saw a 40 ravines in the Down River, Down, yeah, Down River area and it's the railroad park highlighted in this map. From the north southern Rosedale Valley to the northern Edward Garden, and from the east Cedarville Valley to the west E.T. Central Park. It is also the location our, of our research partner, the Evergreen. And thanks to Evergreen that be here for our presentation. And we also use this big tree map, which was developed by Evergreen, sorry, Eric Davis from 2016, and have recorded some heritage trees locations, species, and their size information. We locate the heritage trees by using our Google map in our smartphone and map, them, map those trees as over 15 centimeter dBH and re record their locations, size information. And we also did the seafood casting. This picture is one of my colleague, Yi Chao, who is the next presenter. Um, is doing the civil casting, which is using the binoculars to look up into the medium and upper canopy of the tree and to randomly select three terminal branches to check if they have seeds or not. And later we will input all this information into our big tree map. And here is what we got. This year is actually the fourth year of our study, and the new improvement is the discovery of black maple in the evergreen Brixworth area that still have seeds this year. And we added 162 more trees this year, um, which is around 27, sorry, 24 species, which is the 33% of the out of the 73 native species in Toronto. And we did seed forecasting for 889 trees. And among them, the top four were um, Northern Red Oak, Sugar Maple, White Oak, and Eastern White Pine. And here, is the map that we made to show the location, for example, like the red oak. Um, every dot here represents an individual tree, and the red one means they have seeds this year, and the black one means they didn't have seeds. So for over four years, we only have found 24 native species in Toronto's ravine, uh, which is out of the 70, 73 native species, around 33%. So actually, we want to mention is that is, it is not easy to find them and locate them, and as the living seed bank, we only have 24 species right now. So, and some of them are really have, only have few individuals. As you can see, actually half of them are less than 10 heritage trees. We should concern about this because uh, we need these trees as a living seed bank for forest restoration. And of course, we want to increase their individuals because we don't want all seed that come from one tree because it will decrease the genetic diversity and also the not good for the forest health in the long term. Um, yeah, the species richness of our seed bank is actually pretty low. Um, now, this one is to show you the species richness from a ravine level. The table is the summary of the native species richness of 40 ravine that we visit this summer. And of course, here should be additional, additional diversity because we only focus on the heritage trees. 
the pie chart in the map is the is to show the all native species in one ravine and out of the 73. As you can see, all ravines only have a few native species, which is the high, the highest one is 16, and to the lowest one is three. So which is from 22% to 4%. If you really want to restore these ravines, we have to work together and look more, because we only just map these trees along the trail. Um, so now what we have to do is to look for and as we all know that native species richness right now is pretty low, and the native species just make them worse. The invasive insects that highly destructive to native species like American beech and ash, they were only there were like two dominant species in Park Drive Ravine in 1970s. But right now they also they both dec decrease for the population because of this. Um, invasive insect like the beech scale, which cause the beech bug disease, and also the EAB, as we mentioned before. Despite the city's best effort to hold the EAB back, current estimates suggest that it will kill off 3.2 million ash trees in the GTA. And the most common the invasive tree species in Toronto is the Illinois maple, which is also the most common trees in the city. Now their population is exceeding around 700,000. Because the trees in massive nature, they can they have their soil root system and they can create a shady area that with low light to inhibit the invasive the noise, sorry the native species ceiling growth and also the establishment. From the 1970 to 2017, Noir Maple had already occupied canopy cover in cities within from 10% to 40%. And according to the research of the Toronto Ravine. From 10% to over 50, sorry, 40% of the ravine area were now covered by invasive species. From 1970s to 2015, and this trend is continuously growing. So, with so much things to, going on and so much things that we need to do, how do we prioritize our efforts to focus on the, some priority species out of the 73 native? To so have us that question. Um, we came up with the species priority rank. Um, it's simple, I'm going to walk you through it. So it has just three components of the 73 native species. The first one is the seed production interval, and the second one is population abundance, and the third one is the potential threats like the diseases that may affect their growth and health. So for the first one, we first divided it to the low, medium, and high, and also unknown. Low is like their seed production interval is long, like longer than three years. The medium means its seed production interval is around three years. The high means they produce seed frequently, maybe annually or one to two years. And the population abundance, we also divided into low, medium, high, and low. One. Low means they're rare to be seen and hard to be seen in a city or in the nature area. The medium means they're common. The high means they can be seen everywhere. And the unknown here represents that no related information was found so we cannot confident to rank them. And after that, we put all species that population abundance low into high priority because we don't want to, we don't want to lose them and their population is too low, they may, we may need to restore them. And species with high abundance, high abundance, yeah, and high seed intervals, we rank it into low medium, low priority because their seed production is frequently and their population is everywhere. So we may have to collect their seeds more easily than the others. So for example, we look into sugar maple. We all know about sugar maple and we can see them actually everywhere. So for its population abundance, we rank into high. And its seed production interval is between three to seven years, which means it's, a, it's more than three years, so it should be low. And the final rank for sugar maple is medium. And we look into another example is white oak. They're actually common in Toronto's natural area, so the population abundance is medium, and the seed production interval is between three to five years. So it's also long, long, longer than three years. It's also low. So the final rank for white oak is medium, uh, so, sorry, it's high. And because of the invasion of EAB, we shift all ash species into high priority. Yeah. 
And here is a table for all 73 species native to Toronto, except the one that's unknown, because we cannot find any related information. And overall, 35 native species, which were like 48% or half of the 73 native species to Toronto, are in high priority. For example, like we mentioned before, like the ash and American beech, and also elm species, they were all like impacted by the invasive species. And for species like white oak, because there, there is a long seed interval and they are common in the area that we want, we don't want to actually miss their seeds, so it is in high priority. And because of the impact of the oak wheel, it is also makes sense. And for endangered species like red mulberry and butternut, we also put it in the high priority. And collecting their seeds are, will help to restore their population too. Um, so based on what we have, our work is actually make us easier to collect seeds and restore the forest in a number of ways and help us, help us prioritize our efforts and to fo focus on the species that are in high priority and to increase the ability and efficiency of Toronto to restore its forest. The number one that we have is the species richness, which we found is pretty low and needed to be increased. So we expand our scope of the study to include the public property and more of the part of the reeds. And it's very exciting and interesting to get the public involved, to get to know more about the environment or the trees that can increase the public awareness of native species value and also the natural environment sensitivity. The second one that we have is the prioritization. That we have the city of the TRCA and natural local groups like Evergreen to restore the forest and to help them to focus on the efforts um, on the highest priority species. And finally, this picture is here shows part of the acorn that we collect this summer by using our tree map. And the beginner of this project, Eric Davis, has been doing this for the past five years and he collect around 55,000 acre, acorns and grow most of them. At least I want to thank you, Eric Davis, for sharing his knowledge and his help, and also Patrick James for guiding us, and also Annie. Um, unfortunately, she didn't make it here. So um, there are actually 73 new species in Toronto, um, for even serving one species will cost uh, people a lot of energy and time. The next presenter, Ichao, one of my colleagues, he will show you, go deep into the specific species. Thank you. Questions? Toronto is a rather big area, and I, I think, I wonder if you've contrasted the uh, eastern part of Toronto with the central and uh, eastern part. Because from my own, you know, walking and talking to naturalists and, and that, I have found that the um, western part of the city has more uh, native trees, so, and it could maybe help as a strategy for the other side of the city. That the, the trees that tend to be in the uh, western part are the extirpated from the rest of the city are the uh, hickory and the, the, the black walnut, which are of the juglin family, which are um, encourage a chemical, you know, resistance to the dog strangling vine and other invasives. So I, I wonder if you could maybe consider this as part of the, the strategy for the other side of the city. I, I yeah, I mean, like we have to expand our scope of the study to ex to actually service more area of the Toronto and to maybe get seeds from different places. But actually, it can work in Toronto area. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, 
So I think your efforts to prioritize species for action are great because we always need those lists. And you're probably right that there are a lot of species on the priority list, but in some ways having half of the species as a priority is actually not that helpful. So can you prioritize the, priori the, pri the high priority list or is there another way? Like uh, where would you start in that list of 35 species? Yeah, I know it's like half of the native species that we have is a high priority. But actually, I think our study can go deep into specific species, like narrow it down to 10 or maybe five, so that we, we may have uh, extra effort into the other species that are not as urgent as them. Yeah, maybe further study can also study in this place, yeah. Can you just take a quick shot at what factor you might use to narrow it down? Um, I think well, the first one is um, for the population's abundance, also like the high priority for them, and also for the diseases and the stress that, sorry, the effect that's threatening them also cause the decreases in populations can also be a extra, extra things that we need to focus on in the later study. Yep, of course, like, um, for ash species, like the EAB is threatening them, so we may take the high priority for the ash species out of the half high priority one. Yeah. Um, being more familiar with mammals than I am with trees, um, I mean, people do people must do viability population viability modeling for trees as well, right? Like, why not just do full on population viability modeling and look, uh, you know using metapopulation viability modeling, like in some idea about regeneration, which is a function of seed production, et cetera. Um, why not go that route? Sorry, I didn't, didn't understand. Well, like sorry. actual population modeling, uh -huh. as a, like using that as, your, as a way to rank vulnerability. If you can look at uh -huh. population um, dynamics over time and numbers over time and actually get times to extinction, albeit in a modeling context with all sorts of assumptions. Yeah, I think there will be extra factors that can, that can be included in our priority rank because it was the basic one for now. It was the, like the new one, so we may have to include all kinds of factors like you mentioned that maybe in the future study, yeah. Well done, thank you. Um, I'm representing Evergreen, and it's great to see this kind of information coming out. My question would be, uh, how can we continue with the uh, conservation effort and get more public involvement? It, is it through iNaturalist, or is it through citizen science? What is your choices in that, and how can we uh, maybe start allowing the public to start planting some of those uh, species that are more endangered. Um, thank you. It's like for now that we have is a tree map that we can use by everyone, actually by the public. It's simple and we can apply citizen science because I haven't done that, so maybe there's a good idea to have used the tree map that we have. And they have the locations, they have the all kinds of information that we can be used in our latest study. like. They can, the public can use it as a way like they can to recognize the trees, to ID the trees, and also to look at them and to enjoy the beauty of the nature and to more get to know more about the information about tree. And also they can be, it, they can be possible for them to collect more seeds in their public area. Yeah. Just building on, someone was asking about ways to prioritize your priorities. Um, the area where I work in, sort of at the, the northern tip of a lot of species ranges, and even within the park I'm at, some islands have um, rare shrubs that have um, fairly rare genetics, and then some of the other islands seem to be more flooded with the core range genetics. So I'm just curious, um, of these old growth trees you've looked at, are any of them known to have kind of unique or, or rare genetics and more of a comment. If, if so, then that certainly would be a, a way to help prioritize your, your higher list. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. That was, uh, that was great work. Um, for those who, who don't know, these, these two students just came from China a year ago, didn't know any Canadian trees, so it's been pretty, pretty interesting to see how much you can learn in, in one summer getting out there. It's uh, really, really good work. Um, so the native species are one thing. We, we need to, to get these seeds to grow them, maybe a million seeds a year, who knows. Can this work, do you think, be used to inform invasive species like Norway maple and Manitoba maple and prioritize the same kind of thing? In that case, the seeds would be not a good thing to have. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, I think that's a good idea because um, we not we are not only focused on the native species, but we are also focused on invasive species. Um, how was the population of them, and how are they like occupying which place? I think we meet, need to get to know about them more, and then we have the management plan for them to like cooperate with our method, and that would be a good idea. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Mention Manitoba maple as in, invasive species. I wonder if we should rethink this, um, especially in light of climate change. We're very close to the what's always been accepted as a native range of Manitoba maple and if it hadn't you know been introduced it would have be coming here you know soon because of climate change and I think we should maybe you know think of it differently as um, as it is a good tree for wildlife and biodiversity and I think that's maybe simply we should Re reconsider if, if it is an invasive, you know, pest species or not. I wasn't sure if that was a question for me or for Gia Ron. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll help her on that one. Uh, well, it's always a conundrum, the, the native, non-native species. Um, but I think we'll I won't answer that question. I'll, we'll leave that hanging. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.